Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House. I'm taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming September of 2016 premiere auction. And I have two here to show you today. These are both experimental Mauser pistols from the mid to late 1930s. Now the background on these is that Walther had this series of a couple pistols that it had designed that it had been doing reasonably well with, but sales were starting to drop by the 1930s. It had the Mauser 1910-14-34 little pocket pistol, which was widely used by the German military. But again, the 30s, demand is dropping off. They had a, uh, a pocket pistol in 25 as well, a smaller one, and they were also manufacturing Lugers. Well, the Luger, of course, was a contract thing. It wasn't their own uh, intellectual property, and they wanted to have a new pistol of their, a new model, uh, to start selling, try and revigorate some new interest. Now, Mauser had this interesting plan with pistols, which had existed with the model of 1910 as well, or 1909 and 1910, where what they wanted to do was basically have one basic design of pistol that they would manufacture as a large frame for military service pistol style use, and, and also as a small frame for uh, concealed carry pocket civilian type use, which is kind of odd because typically the one of those, the small one will be blowback and the large one will be a locked breech, and you don't really have the same, that's not really something that you can have identical. But they had actually tried it, uh, and we see that with their 1909 and 1910 pistols, where the 1909 was a big, uh, kind of a weird delayed blowback uh, in 9mm Parabellum and 45 and other large cartridges, which ultimately kind of failed and went nowhere while the small scale version, the 1910 and then the 1914 in 32 and 25 auto, those became quite popular. Well, they wanted to do the same thing again. Uh, they had a new engineer that took up this project by the name of Alex Seidel. So again, they ran into this issue of, well, we need one to be locked breech, but we need the other to be blowback, which is kind of weird, but they decided they'd have, at least have the pistol share the same basic aesthetic, the same layout, the same kind of controls, that sort of thing. So even if they were totally different inside to the consumer, they would look like the same family of gun. Okay, it's an interesting take. Uh, go for it. As it turned out, the HSC in 32 Auto and 380 became a very successful and popular gun, kind of like the early small version, the 1910s and 14s and 1934s, while the large-scale locked breech version went nowhere. Now, they started off with this one as the large locked breech version. It has a swinging uh, locking link in it, actually kind of similar to the Walther P38. And the first version that they had was this one, and it's got a recoil spring around the barrel, just like the small ones do. That's a pretty typical, pretty easy, well understood method for putting the recoil spring in an automatic pistol. Well, 1937, there's a German military trial to replace the P08 Luger. The Luger's a good gun, it's accurate, it's reliable. The problem is it's just way too expensive. It's a very early automatic pistol design, it's complex, it takes a ton of money and time to make, and the German army decided enough was enough, they were finally going to replace it with something more cost effective. So they held a competition, and there were four companies that submitted prototype pistols to them. Uh, one was Sauer & Sohn, which we don't know anything about their submission. There don't appear to be any drawings that exist still, no examples of the gun, we don't know. Uh, BSW submitted this interesting gas-locked pistol, uh, which there are three of today. We do have a video on one of those, which you can check out if you're interested. Uh, Walther submitted what would become the P38 to the competition, and then the final entrant was Mauser with the HSV. Now the V uh, stands for experimental. So this is the experimental, tra roughly translating, the experimental double-action pistol. Now what was interesting was the German military had a couple of specifications. It had to be a 9mm Parabellum, it had to be a locked breech pistol. By the way, you can't get away with just a big huge slide blowback 9mm, which Simpson um, of Sewell had tried in the 1920s. I have a video on that one too if you're interested in it. Uh, and it had to have an exposed hammer and an exposed barrel. Why exactly they wanted the exposed barrel, I'm really not sure. It may have been something about cooling. Maybe they just liked the way that looked. I don't know. I haven't come up with any particularly rational reason for it. However, 
An exposed barrel doesn't work with this design because they've got the recoil spring wrapped around the barrel. So Mauser had to come up with a way to put an exposed barrel on this HSV pistol. And they did that by using a, uh, a, a recoil spring system very much like you would find in an automatic Webley pistol or the Le Francais uh, French pistols. So we will take a look at that in detail in just a moment when we disassemble these. Now that allowed them to have an exposed barrel so they submitted these pistols to the trial. Uh, these ended up being probably, the, well definitely, the best performing pistol of the trial. They were extremely good, they were light, they are actually narrower and a little bit smaller than a Walther P38 while still being 9mm Parabellum, 8 round magazine. Uh, they have some interesting features to them that the Walther doesn't. For example, the slide locks open on an empty mag and then automatically closes when you insert a new loaded magazine. Kind of a nice feature, I suppose, from a military perspective. They're really good guns. The problem was they were a little, in some ways, kind of too good, and they were actually substantially more expensive than the Walther entrant. So the German military decided the Walther pistol may not have had quite the polish to it that the Mauser one did, but the Walther was good enough, and it was a lot less expensive, and Walther won the trials. As a result, the HSV kind of pah, dead ended, disappeared into nothing. Now the small scale one that was simply a blowback action would go on to be produced in large numbers, be very popular, they produced them after the war for the commercial market as well, and those are not that hard to get a hold of. The 9mm ones are extremely hard to get a hold of, uh, given that these are, I believe, the only two in existence. So why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at these. We'll pull this one apart and see exactly how all of it works, which is pretty cool. Alright, there's the HSV. Now I know people are going to want to know how it compares to a P38, since that's what the Germans were comparing it to. And fortunately, I always carry a spare P38, just in case comparison requirements crop up. So here we go. You'll see these two pistols are virtually the same size. They're pretty much the same length, the same height. Overlay them here for you. Um, the biggest difference is the HSV's grip is smaller. Uh, it's actually a more comfortable grip. It points better, at least for me it does. And then the HSV is substantially narrower than the P38. You can see that there, primarily in the slide. This is double action. Of course, you can kind of tell because the trigger is that far forward. It does have an exposed hammer spur, which is back here. That's the, uh, the dropped and uncocked position. I can cock the pistol there. You'll notice that the hammer spur has a solid uh, shield on it on both sides. So when you cock the pistol, you don't actually open up the action for debris to get inside. Just for comparison's sake here, when you cock the P38, you do. You open up this spot with the firing pin. Not necessarily a good idea. Now the magazine release on the HSV is here on the bottom. Push back, pull the magazine out, nine rounds of nine millimeter parabellum. Now one interesting thing is that when we look at the other uh, HSV, this is the one that was a basically the earlier uh, commercial prototype. On this one, it actually has a button release. Uh, same magazine, by the way, these two, other than the fact that one has a heel catch and this one has a catch right up here. These two magazines do interchange. They're the same, same mag body, same dimensions. The safeties on both are located here on the slide. There is no decocker. Um, if you want to decock the pistol, take the magazine out, pull the trigger. I will point out that the P38 also has a heel release and I suspect that was another requirement of German ordinance, although I didn't see it in the documentation. I may have missed that. Now a quick look at some markings. You can see we have uh, the Mauser production markings here. This actually originally said HSC and they overstamped it with an HSV to turn it from the, I suppose, from the commercial version into the experimental version for military trials. It's nine millimeter. The safety has an S for safe or sicher, something like that in German, and a red dot for the fire position. Nothing on this side except the serial number right there. This is V for experimental, 1030. Uh, I believe Mauser started at 1001 on their series of experimental pistols, uh, which did not necessarily start with just the HS types. There is a very small crown proof mark right there. If we look at the magazine, you'll see that the magazine is serial numbered to the gun 
and it's also got that digit 2. That would be because this gun was originally issued with two magazines, and this was the second, the spare magazine. Uh, it only comes with that one, by the way. Magazine number one is long gone. Alright, with that scene, let's go ahead and take this apart. I'm going to start with the upper half, and to do this, we need to have the gun the hammer cocked, we need to put it on safe, and then there is this plunger right here in the front of the trigger guard. And what I need to do is pull the slide back just slightly, and then push this plunger down that direction. Uh, that will allow the slide and the barrel assembly to uh, come forward and then off the gun. So you won't be able to see much of this because it's tight in there, but just kind of all goes bleh and comes apart. So pretty easy, really. There we go. There are three main components. And on the barrel, you can see that we have this. This is the locking wedge. Um, works similar to a P38, but not quite the same. So this is the locked position, and then this is the unlocked position. All right, so the way this works is that this uh, pivoting locking piece can travel in these two grooves in the slide assembly. When it moves all the way back, then this piece tilts up against the barrel, and in this position, it's no longer in line with those grooves, and it locks the barrel and the slide together, right there. Now, you can see this round connecting bar right there. That piece is sitting under this angled hook in the front of the frame. And the way this works is, when this piece is pushed all the way up, it can't move. It's, these two are locked together. And then as this whole assembly starts to move backwards, that round bar gets pulled downward by this angled surface. And once it pulls it far enough, let me get it just lined up right, right there. Once it pulls it down this far, now the two are unlocked and the slide can continue to move backwards while this bar has reached a stop. It's, it's pulled tight against this triangular corner in there. That stops the barrel. The slide can then continue backwards to cycle, throw out the empty case, and load a new case. All right, now here is the inside of our frame assembly with all sorts of little tiny bitty German parts. We'll start with this plunger, the takedown plunger, which you can see moves right there. This actually hooks against this surface right there on the barrel. That prevents the barrel from going forward. When you pull this down, now the barrel can go forward far enough to disengage from the various rails that it's in. For example, this being in this slot. So that's the disassembly. Now if we look at the fire control group, we can see that this is the face of the hammer. When I pull the trigger, that's going to go forward up into position where it would hit that firing pin right there. Spring-loaded, it's a little too deep in there for me to get with my finger, but you get the idea. There's the firing pin. That fires the gun. It does have a magazine safety. So we'll see that actually when I take the grips off. So why don't I do that now? We also have this really cool uh, recoil spring mechanism under, under there that we can take a look at. All right, the grips are off. They just are held on by a single screw. So we can set those aside. And then just for visibility's sake, I'll pull the magazine out. Then this is one and number two of the dual recoil springs. These work just like uh, well, primarily just like a Webley automatic pistol, where this hook at the top holds on to the slide, and when the slide goes back, it compresses this spring, which puts tension on this lever, tries to push the lever forward, thus it acts like a recoil spring. Um, I'm not even going to try and do that with the slide off. Uh, we'll put the slide back on in a minute and show you that. So what this allows, allowed Mauser to do was actually put in an effective, a strong enough, durable enough recoil spring system and still have a nice exposed barrel. Normally, if the barrel's sitting here, you've got your breech block right there, there's really no place to put a big coil recoil spring. 
Uh, that's why you normally see them under the barrel out here. Or you have to come up with like some small little springs running alongside the action, which is what they did in the P-38. They put a pair of recoil springs down in here. That's why the slide on the P-38 is wide, is to give space for those recoil springs inside. Now this spring back here is what puts tension on the hammer. You can see this hammer strut comes up right here and goes all the way through. And it also acts as the tension spring for the magazine release. Now the magazine safety is necessary. You can see here I can pull the trigger and nothing happens. What I have to do is push this piece up just slightly so that it hits this little half round guy. Right here you can see it's dropping just below that, that half round piece. When I push it up, now it's in contact and it will drop the hammer. You can see up here. So what the magazine is actually doing is pushing this piece like this. You can see there's a little lip on the front here. When that lip goes up, the rear goes down. That allows this to lift up. When I put in the magazine, the edge of the feed lip catches on that little lip right there, which latches it into position. And now, when I pull the trigger, it's going to fire. One word of warning. Um, most folks watching this will probably not ever take apart this pistol because there's only one of them. However, there is a decent chance that some of you will be taking apart Webley automatic pistols that have this style of spring. A note of caution, these things, every single pistol design I have ever seen with them, they are prone to falling off and going kerproing across the room because there's usually not much holding them on once you take the grip panels off. Uh, now the double action system here is also a bit complex. We can take a look at all the working bits here. When I pull the trigger, this hook is going to come out, which allows the trigger to drop, the hammer to drop, sorry. Hammer hits. Then if I cock this manually, now it's uh, at half cock. Just prevents it from going forward. And then if I cock it the rest of the way, you can see it's going to pick up on that second hook, lock in place there. So this piece is able to uh, move forward under spring tension, just like that. Now it's at half cock and then back to full. Now I've been sort of ignoring this guy, this poor guy. Um, the reason being that this, this one, the, the disassembly plunger is stuck in place, probably from grease, but I don't want to force it. So I'm not able to pull the slide off this one. Now they operate the same way as far as the locking system is concerned, except for, of course, this one has the spring up here. So it does not have a spring under the grips. It does, however, have a neat feature that I do want to show you. Namely, the way the grips are held on by this lanyard loop. If you look closely here, there is a little tab right there that's holding this lanyard loop in so that you can't just pull it out backwards that direction. And we can see underneath that the lanyard, that the two tangs of this lanyard loop are actually holding the grips in place. So in order to take it off, so in order to take it off, I'm going to very gently depress that. Okay. Now I've got it just slightly pulled out. Now I can pull this lanyard loop the rest of the way out like that. And then the grips just come off. There we go. So if we compare these two, you can see they're, they're the same design. There's a big hole in the hammer of this one that isn't on the earlier gun. But other than that, we got the same thing going on here. All right, reassembly of those grips is just, is actually a lot easier. Uh, put the grips in place, and then we're going to slide this tang right there. It's got these two little spring-loaded pieces, so when I snap it in place like that, now it's locked in, and it holds the grips in place. Well, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. You know, I always enjoy taking a look at Trials pistols. It's just really interesting to me to see the ideas that were out there that may not have caught on, for better or for worse. Uh, if you'd like these to catch on in your own collection, maybe you have a bunch of Walthers, or maybe you have a bunch of Mausers, or maybe you just like Trials pistols. Well, take a look at the description uh, text below. You'll find links there to both of these pistols catalog pages at Rock Island. Check out their pictures and their description, 
And if you're interested, you can place a bid over the phone or online or come up here to Rock Island in person to participate in the auction live. Thanks for watching.